Get my shoes and out the door. Five, I'm alive. Six, seven, eight, feeling great. BYWG Tribe, this is Dr. Noah. We wanted to make you aware of our never-before-featured book of the month and a best of the best for the product of the month for May 2018. Keep in mind, all the links, discount codes, and special offers for the product and book will be listed in the show notes in iTunes, in our weekly newsletter, and on our website at www.beyondyourwildestgenes.com at the Listen Now tab. Our book of the month is Neurosculpting, a whole brain approach to heal trauma, rewrite limiting beliefs, and find wholeness by my friend Lisa Wimberger. Our product of the month is ButcherBox. ButcherBox is the number one source for grass-fed and grass-finished beef, free-range organic chicken, and heritage breed pork, delivered via subscription on a monthly or bi-monthly basis. I personally use ButcherBox and highly recommend. The special offer for BYWG listeners is for any new subscriber, you'll get $10 off your first box and free bacon included in all boxes ordered for 2018. Yep, you heard that right. Free bacon for all orders and boxes ordered in 2018. You can hear Lisa Wimberger on the podcast in May 2018 and Michael Salguro, CEO of ButcherBox, in the BYWG podcast archives June 19th, 2017 on our website at www.beyondyourwildestgenes.com. Hello and welcome back to Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. My name is Dr. Noah DeCoyer and I am your co-host. Today our guest is Dr. Will Cole. I listened to Dr. Cole on the Keto FX Summit, loved his message and thought it would be great to have him on. So it's great to talk to you, Dr. Cole. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, let me, let me run through your bio and then we'll get started. Uh, Dr. Cole is a graduate from Southern California University of Health Sciences in Los Angeles, California. He has his postdoctorate education and training in functional medicine and clinical nutrition to the Institute for Functional Medicine and Functional Medicine University. Dr. Cole consults in Pittsburgh area in phone or webcam consultations for people around the world. He specializes in clinically investigating underlying factors and customizing health programs for chronic conditions such as thyroid issues, autoimmune, hormonal dysfunctions, digestive disorders, diabetes, heart disease, and fibromyalgia. Dr. Cole has been featured numerous times on Pittsburgh News Affiliates, WTAE-TV, KDKA-TV, and WB. G.H. Fox. He is a health writer for international publications such as Mind Body Green and Lectures Nationally. How are you today? I'm doing good. That was a mouthful. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I always listen to listen to the, uh, the the TV affiliate names are always, they always give me a little chuckle when I <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, do. I know it right. So uh, so that bio is a little bit informal. How about just kind of yeah a little bit more of uh, informal bio on how you became who you are and how'd you end up in Pittsburgh and all those kind of things? Yeah. So I, I kind of was always interested in wellness growing up. And then I, I heard I was at school at sort of at SUHS, Southern California University of Health Sciences, as you had said. And it's sort of this integrative school where there's DCs and MDs and all and LACs and all these great, brilliant minds in the health world that want to just get people better. And I heard of a guy called Datis Karazian, and he had gone to my school who was older than I was and was talking about this thing called functional medicine. And, you know, even today, Datis is major in the functional medicine world, but he's maybe not mainstream as much as like a Mark Hyman or something like that. But he is brilliant. And I thought, I want to do that. Like, that's amazing, brilliant, like marrying the best of Western medicine, which is diagnostics and finding out from an objective perspective what's going on and you know the best of alternative health which is actually getting somebody healthy and then kind of uniting the the two fields together and another word for functional medicine is integrative medicine and that's really I think what we do in functional medicine is is integrate what works and what do, and, and leave out what doesn't um, so 
uh, yeah, that's how it come, came to be. And then I was I was in Southern California. My wife's from Southern California, so we lived in Los Angeles for a while. I still go back often for work and for family. But um, I was born, not actually not, I was born in Iowa of all places. But I was raised in Pittsburgh, and yeah, that's where I call home. So we came back home and to give a, a more a, a slower paced life for our kids. And but most of our patients are virtual, so I could be anywhere in the whole world. Um, I st- I'm, I'm doing what I, I what, what we're doing now is what I normally do uh, for patients is just talking via Skype or FaceTime and Google Hangouts. And it's we mainly have a virtual a functional medicine practice. Well, now, now are you getting uh, the, your third nor'easter in the last 10 days up in Pittsburgh? Because that's where I am. <laughs> that's where yeah. Going. So the weather we, in, in California sounds a lot better. A lot better. I, I know it, right? I just came back from LA for work last week and it, I saw like the Instagram feed of like the snow and I'm like, oh man, I, I want to, let's extend the trip a little bit, but I couldn't, I had patience. So, but uh, you know what, Pittsburgh, for some reason, I, we are not getting the craziness that the Eastern seaboard is getting. We have a little bit of that land buffer <laughs> that we aren't getting as much as, as you all on the East coast. So, oh, so you, um, you mentioned it a little bit in, in your bio, your personal bio about. And, and my question to you is, because we've had other functional medicine practitioners on the line, the, the co-hosts of this uh, podcast are functional medicine doctors. What is what is your what is your definition, or how do you define functional medicine? If I had to boil it down to a few, I think main points that differentiates us from mainstream conventional medicine, then be number one, we interpret labs using a thinner reference range. So anybody that's listening knows, hey, I have this lab from my doctor, and they say, you know, they'll give my number, and then they'll give this reference range, this normal interval X to Y number range. Well, we get that reference range from a statistical bell curve average of the people who go to that specific lab. And if you go to another lab, you'll see that reference range may vary from lab to lab. They're not standardized. With a few exceptions, the majority of them are not standardized. And there's a lot of people that go to their doctor, hey, I don't feel well, like, can we have labs ran? And these labs come back largely or entirely quote unquote normal, even though the patient knows, heck, I do not feel normal, but I'm told, you know, everything's fine. There was nothing wrong here, um, what they're un- unintentionally being told or what's, what's unintentionally going on here is saying really that they're a lot like the other sick people that make up the population of that lab because who are people that typically go to labs are people with health problems. So in functional medicine, we, and you know this, but we take people with health problems out of that reference range and what's left is that tighter interval of numbers of where your body is thriving, your your health is, is an excellence. Uh, it's the functional range where your body is functioning the best hence where we get our name functional medicine so we're looking and comparing the patient to optimal wellness not the average of people who go to labs which is not uh, a good average to compare yourself to if you want to feel great and be great Um, and then number two we run more comprehensive labs in functional medicine so we're looking at these root factors like well whatever is relevant to the case history so so we want to look at things like uh, Uh, underlying gut issues or autoimmune inflammation issues or food sensitivities or hormonal imbalances or toxicity issues, whatever is relevant to the individual, we want to look beyond the ICD-10 code, the the diagnosis code, and then what's the root core issue that's causing that? Um, So we do some clinical investigation from that standpoint. And then we also in functional medicine, we realize we're all different. There's not a cookie cutter, one size fits all approach to getting healthy. And the predominance of my patients are people w- somewhere on this autoimmune inflammation spectrum. And, you know, it's you, if you, you cannot hang your hat on one magic bullet, there is no magic bullet for these people. Um, and I've seen great healthy things work for one person and then flare the next person up. So I try not to have a bias as this, like, this is the way that everybody should do things because you have to take into account biological variability, which means we're all different. So, um, we use food as medicine, we use herbal botanical medicines, lifestyle changes, medications when needed, uh, to really be a holistic evidence-based healthcare for the individual. 
Yeah, I, I think that idea of functional ranges is really important. And, and you talked about Tatis Karazi, and, and you know, one of the companies that I like to use most is Apex Energetics, and he's formulated a lot of their programs, and they have uh, incredible functional ranges. And they are dramatically different than what we would normally consider as what other docs consider normal. Yeah, yeah. And it really illuminates for the patient because they think, well, everything's fine, and they have these pile of labs with – numbers that no one's ever explained many times like what what they even mean so to really even put the current numbers that somebody has from their pcp or endocrinologist or other specialists to really say okay what does this mean uh, there's so much information oftentimes that you can get from and the basic labs they run already currently um, because it's not been kind of seen through the lens of functional optimal ranges, you can kind of see, even though it's quote unquote normal from the lab standpoint, well, I mean, there's a lot of things to, that can we can work on even with just the basic labs. I agree. Now, I'm going to call a little bit of an audible, and I mentioned that I really liked your talk on the Keto FX Summit and something you brought up in that talk that, that I knew that I see often in my patients that totally blew my mind and you were t and, and you brought it up as autoimmunity and I know you deal with a lot of autoimmune cases and I'm just going to read these stats that and then I want you to comment on them because it's so important. Um, if you were to get diagnosed with MS, you would need 70% of the myelin sheath to be, dis uh, to be uh, destroyed before they can uh, diagnose you. 90% of adrenal cells for Addison's disease, 80% destruction of your villi before they can uh, quantify it as celiac disease. Now, th those are disturbing numbers for a lot of reasons, but can you elaborate on what where I'm heading with, the, with the listing those numbers? Uh, yeah, exactly. So there's about 50 million Americans that have autoimmune diseases and the, the numbers that you mentioned that I mentioned on the other talk was the criteria for diagnosis, either, for example, the Addison's disease, that's actually the criteria. And the other two are more or less the estimates to be seen on a biopsy or an imaging study um, to see lesions uh, on an imaging study. Those, there's significant destruction done. And, there, and by the time that's that bad, but by the time the immune system's destroyed enough of that tissue to say, okay, what's there? That's been going on for years. It's estimated about 10 years prior to the diagnosis, these things were brewing. They're chronic issues that degenerate to the point that then, okay, we say, all right, this is a problem, and let's give it an immunosuppressant or a biologic drug or a Tecfidera or whatever the appropriate you know, medication would be. Um, but this is brewing. This autoimmune infl inflammation has been brewing for a long time. Uh, so there's three stages on the autoimmune inflammation spectrum. There's silent autoimmunity, meaning if you ran labs, they would you know, see some positive markers, but they'll say, oh, well, some people have as positive markers and nothing ever happens. Like, it's just just no big deal. And that is true. I mean, there's some people that have positive antibodies, they'll always be in silent autoimmunity. And then stage two is autoimmune reactivity, meaning problems are starting to be seen on the horizon. You're not feeling well, you're having strange symptoms, you're having brain fog or fatigue or pain or neurological symptoms or anxiety. But again, it doesn't fit the criteria of being giving a diagnosis code. There, you, these people in stage two in autoimmune reactivity, they're told well, it looks autoimmune or it looks like fibromyalgia or it looks like chronic fatigue or they're sent to tons of specialists and they kind of basically are told, wait till you're bad enough to then be put on an autoimmune medication if, you, if the time comes. But again, not everybody degenerates to stage three. Some people will stay in stage two autoimmune reactivity for the rest of their life life and feel miserable and never be diagnosed. They're just are they're having health problems. And then stage three is the end stage. By end stage, I don't mean death. I be end stage I mean it's fitting the criteria to be diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. So that's 
over 100 different autoimmune diseases, an additional 40 above that 100 that had, have at least an autoimmune component. So a lot of health problems like MS and Addison's and Hashimoto's disease and lupus. And I mean, the list goes on and on. Um, but the commonality is that the immune system thinks parts of the body are, is a pathogen, is a virus or bacteria, and it's turning against itself and attacking uh, parts of, the, of our body. Um, so yeah, this, that's what I meant in that talk about showing that the significant destruction that has to happen before we call it what it is, before we label it with the disease code. I don't – I hope people realize how important that, that is because there – in functional medicine, there is interventions prior to that end stage. In regular quote-unquote medicine, there really is no intervention uh, and it's uh, – it's it's it, it blew my mind when you when you uh, gave those numbers 90 percent adrenal destruction in Addison that's mind blowing yeah, I know and I had to go back when I wrote I re heard that re that statistic first when I was writing an article years ago and I would had to go back and check it because I'm like wait I want to double check my reference on that standpoint like that doesn't even make sense but it's actually on like this the main governing. Uh, body that determines diagnosis for Addison's disease, that is the criteria. So uh, it is quite mind-blowing to think that is the state that things has to happen before then they will do something and validate why somebody is going through what they're going through. It's crazy. I mean, then at that point, they really don't have much for these people anyway for any of these autoimmune diseases other than the medication like the, that I mentioned. Uh, so like you said, what sense does it make to your to wait till your body's destroyed enough of itself to they okay, then put you on a steroid. What can you do now, wherever you're at on that inflammation spectrum, whether it's just minor and maybe will never become an autoimmune disease. And I want people to be very clear. There's, we're not saying everybody on this spectrum is going to become, have an autoimmune disease. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that wherever you're at, let's do what we can to, to mitigate the risk factors, to dampen the inflammation, whatever has to happen, let's improve your quality of life. And I promise you, anybody on a steroid or these biologic drugs, the majority of these people will tell you this is no walk in the park. So, I mean, even the result of when you are diagnosed, it's like, well, this is the option you're given. These people are struggling in a major ways, despite being compliant patients and taking the medications they, that they are given and the options they are given. Right. So, so we're talking about autoimmunity. What other um, groups of disease processes does functional medicine shine where traditional medicine lacks in many ways? Yeah. So I, the people I definitely have a heart for are people on the autoimmune inflammation spectrum, but that is like far reaching implications there because it impacts every system of your body. So the main People that I see, and again, some of them don't have autoimmunity, but there are people that have gut issues where, again, 75% of the immune system is in the gut. So there is an immune component when someone has a gut issue, but it's not doesn't mean they all have autoimmunity. So we're looking at underlying gut issues. We see a lot of cases like that. Uh, we see a lot of cases that have um, brain components, which there's a gut-brain connection there. So people with anxiety and depression and brain fog and neurological symptoms and then hormonal issues, which again, there's a gut brain, gut brain component there too. Uh, but things like thyroid issues and adrenal HPA axis issues are what's commonly referred to as adrenal fatigue. Uh, so those are the main issues that I think the functional medicine excels with. Why? Because they're all kind of given one medication and they're told, okay, if that medication doesn't work, you basically, the only option you have is to switch brands, <laughs> the same medication. And that's all the options that they're given. And that's, that works sometimes. And there are people that see results from that and improvements on that. But there's a lot of people that fall through the cracks of that one size fits all approach. Exactly. Now, from your clinical experience and training, is there one overriding underlying factor that generates most of people's ill health? Uh, and again, it's, it is tough because it, there's, it's hard to, to talk about the nuance and the complexities of someone's biochemistry. But if I had to hang my hat on like one thing, 
And I, the f- kind of component that I see the most often, not everybody, but most people, it are underlying gut issues. Um, and it's 75% of the immune system, as I'd mentioned. It's the foundation of health. Hippocrates, the f- father of modern medicine, as we all know, it's, he said all disease begins in the gut. And um, now re- really research is catching up with that antiquity, that the, the fact that the majority of health problems that we see today at least have a gastrointestinal or microbiome component to them. Uh, it's associated with many different health problems that we see uh, today. Uh, yeah, so I, if I had to hang my hat on one thing, one most basically, what's the stone that has most likely have some uh, some critters underneath it? It would be the gastrointestinal system. So, you know, when... You know, when I looked at your website, uh, which, by the way, has a great design, loads of information on it, but you see a lot of things listed, and it's many of the things you've already listed and talked about already, autoimmunity, brain health, gut health, hormone health, thyroid. Why Why do these problems or concerns or health conditions come up over and over and over again in a functional medicines doctor's arena? Well, I think it's important to to keep an open mind. I think these are the people that are suffering the most that are looking for answers. And I think that's probably part of it. It's that when when you see great solutions for these people's problems, it's like, okay, look, there there is options for you. Uh, You don't have to settle for feeling lousy. And I think a lot of times people in these categories settle. They settle for a, this is my only option option in mainstream medicine, I don't have any other option, or B, they're overwhelmed with the amount of information on Dr. Google and they don't know what the heck they should be doing. Um, So the fact that we can kind of fine tune what's going on here and uh, maybe boil down what's necessary for them, I think, honestly, those are the, I mean, at least those are the people that I'm focusing on. I think there are other people in the functional medicine world that are focusing on other issues, maybe like cardiometabolic issues or maybe some cancer issues. That's not my wheelhouse, so to speak, but um, uh, the people that I talk to and I spend my time with and really immerse myself in their case are the people that I mentioned before. It's really great. Now, uh, you mentioned also before, you use botanicals, supplements, uh, food as medicine. Do you have a particular bent on on how a person should eat? Is there a template? Is it a, is it a paleo template? We all know the rage right now is keto. Uh, is it fine-tuned for each individual patient? Uh, what is your take there? Well, I'm on a ketogenic podcast called Keto Talk uh, with Jimmy Moore. So I, I would be um, I would be probably inaccurate to not mention that, um, <laughs> to know that I maybe have some personal that's how I live my life, and it's how, it is a great application to use for a lot of people. But I I tell everybody that's coming to me that knows, okay, I talk on this podcast. It's I'm not a ketogenic doctor. I don't think that that's the cure all for everyone's woes. I, I think it's a tool to use when it's clinically relevant and it produces good results. And look, if it doesn't work for the person, okay, is it a tweaking? Is it a modification? Is it what are we missing there and not throwing the baby out with the bathwater and saying, well, it doesn't work for me and just <laughs> let's quit it. It's maybe some a modification and the person's not doing it right for their body. But with that said, I still don't hang my hat on that and say, well, I'm not so uh, myopic or have some bias saying this is the cure-all for everybody to say, well, what else can we do? And there's a lot of tools in a functional medicine practitioner's toolbox, and at least for myself, that I can use really what works and, and avoid what doesn't for the individual. So I think that there's a commonality between everybody. It's lower carbohydrate. It doesn't necessarily have to be ketogenic, but it's lower carb in some way. Um, but within the ra- realm of lower carbohydrates, there are people that can moderate carbohydrates and do great. And there's even some exceptions that do even higher carbohydrates from real foods that do great. So I don't even hang my hat on the carb thing too much. I would just say, as a general rule, most people tend to do lower to moderate carbohydrates. And then whether when you're in the realm of labeling different types of diets, I have patients doing AIP diet and a paleo diet and vegan diets and vegetarian diets, mainly based on what personal preferences. And there's different uh, gut issues that tend to do better with more plant-based with maybe some fish and being more fish-centric and 
that way. So I, I, um, yeah, I kind of keep my mind open to what works and what the patient's personal preference is, which is part of it too. Some people just don't really dig a certain type of food and you kind of have to make it realistic and practical. And that's part of our job too in functional medicine is not just saying, well, on paper, this should, this should be your way. This should be, this makes sense. Let's do this. But they may not like those foods. And it's like, okay, do you really, you can't just kind of force somebody to love all these foods. You have to make it work for them. Um, so that's, I don't know if that answered your question, but it's kind of everything, but it's all, it's everything's real food. Um, but it's finding out what works for the individual. Yeah, I think what's most important for the audience to realize is, is that within functional medicine, everything is tailor-made for that individual and that individual concern. So there is never a cookie-cutter program for a patient. It is always designed for them. Yeah, exactly. So it, it allows, I think, more wiggle room and more, uh, like you said, customization to the individual. And that's good. That's good. But the patients need that. Patients need having flexibility in finding out what works for them versus saying just like with the, we don't want to be the green version of what they got from conventional medicine, which is like, well, if you can't, if you don't do on this medication, it's like, well, see you later. We don't want to say, well, if you can't do this diet or this natural medicine, I'll see you later. It's like, okay, what, what can we do? Let's be pragmatic about it and let's be nuanced about uh, what the individual needs. Now, I, I just finished the uh, Longevity Diet by Walter Longo. Did you read that book yet, Dr. Cole? I, I have. I have read it. Uh, the, it's the Fasting Mimicking Diet, correct? Yeah. Have you tinkered with that with yourself or with any patients yet? Yeah, I I I, I, ver, I would say versions of it. I would probably not because I think they sell like certain products, don't they? Yeah, they do. Um, yeah, I haven't gotten their products and all of that, but the basic premise of it, sort of a plant-based keto, really low carb, higher fat diet with some intermittent fasting involved. Yeah, so I variations of that probably wouldn't be officially fasting mimicking diet, but versions of it um, I definitely have utilized in my clinic. Yeah, it's it, it was an it was an interesting book and and uh, well written. I mean, slanted towards their product, but still still a good read. And the whole idea of of how beneficial fasting can be in certain circumstances is pretty fascinating as well. Yeah, definitely. I think the intermittent fasting as a whole is some, definitely a tool that I use a lot. And it's about fine tuning it and finding out what's right. Again, some people can be over eager. They read an article. Uh, on online and they say, okay, I want to do this. And then they feel worse and they think intermittent fasting is not for them. They may, may just have been doing it too aggressively for their body. But there's so many cool ways that you can do intermittent fasting to really um, increase autophagy, which I know that probably that's mentioned in the book, but basically cellular repair and it helps with gut healing and decreasing inflammation levels. It's, it's a really cool applications with intermittent fasting. Yeah, I, I like I know for me personally, I could do about 14 hours. After 14 hours, I'm ravenous, and that's just the way it's worked best for me personally. Yeah, yeah, I I, I fast. I think most days during the week, at least, I intermittent fast the majority of the day. I, I just enjoy it. I get I'm busy with patients anyway, so it's like <laughs> it's like one less thing I have to think about. But then I have a normal dinner in the evening, and I'm, I do that a, lo a lot of times during the week, and it works for me. But it doesn't work for everybody, so I don't I think that everybody should do that. But I agree. Yeah. I agree. Now, um, uh, in our preamble before we actually started recording, we we actually mentioned the project that you're working on that's going to be released in the summer. Are we allowed to at least intro that a little bit or no? Yeah, totally for sure. It's it's on Amazon already, and I appreciate that. Thank you so much. It, it's a, actually a plant based ketogenic book. I'm sort of sort of the um, amalgamation of plant, the best of plant based and the best of the ketogenic diet. It's called Ketotarian. Um, so it's it's a uh, I'm very proud of it, and I'm. Um, it's on Amazon for pre-order right now, and it's there's tons of yummy recipes and pictures, and I actually got the people that um, took all the pictures um, for Whole30 to do it. Um, great RDs there, and Melissa Hartwig introduced me to them, and they're they're great, awesome people, and it's a beautiful book and a lot of good science nerd information for those that are inclined to like that kind of stuff. 
Yeah, we will. We, as we discussed, we will definitely, as soon as that's released, we'll definitely have you back on for sure. Uh, Thank you. Two final questions. Um, one is more of like a fun question. Uh, daily routine, your daily routine rhythms of, of Dr. Cold from waking to sleeping. What is your routine or rhythm? Okay, so um, I wake up. I'm, I'm pretty much a very routine person. I always have been. So I wake up in the morning. Um, I normally, before I even open my eyes, I thank God for my life. And I just am really thankful for just each day and trying to just have a, almost a tiny moment of mindfulness uh, for the day that, that's ahead. And uh, then I get ready pretty quickly. I'm fasting in the morning, so I don't have to make breakfast. I normally have a cup of coffee in the morning, iced coffee sometimes, like a cold brew. And I will fast. And then I'm jumping into seeing patients. So I have patients most of the week, um, all day long. So I have a um, busy schedule and I won't. I'll just drink tea in the morning. And then at lunchtime, if I do eat, it'll be, you know, a healthy lunch of some sort, or I'll fast and I'll have sort of a bulletproof type coffee at lunch if I'm going to do some intermittent fasting just to get some fat in. So it's not a full intermittent fasting, but it's sort of this modified version of it. And then that kind of tides me over till dinner. And I'm, I'm basically boring during the day because I'm just seeing patients. So it's a lot of action going on, but it's not with myself. It's other people's stories. And then in the um, in the evening, I come home and my kids are are there and I get to spend time with them. And yeah, I, we, I, we typically make dinner together and then it's the bedtime ritual and that's, that's hours of reading books in, the, in their rooms. And then I, I do three to four days a week. I do high intensity interval training at home because I want to, because I'm gone at work a lot and I travel a lot for work. I'd like to be home as much as I can be. Uh, so I work out at home and, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's probably pretty boring compared to all your other guests, but that's no, my life. No, you know, it, I, I started asking this question maybe 20 interviews ago and most people have defined rhythms and routines, but there is that it, it's come up a few times where people were very regimented for a very long time and just decided that they're not going to do that anymore and just kind of go with the flow of whatever brings uh, comes to their day. Now, I currently in my life, and I don't think you could see that. I, I can't see that in my life yet, but maybe there might be a time when I could see that as well. <laughs> yeah, I think different, maybe different seasons. Right now, my whole life's on a schedule with patients and then the weekends, it's it's other functions. So yeah, but yeah, maybe someday. I think that would be nice to have that opportunity. I think my, my father-in-law just retired recently. He's a Los Angeles sheriff and he's living that life now. It's like semi-regimented, but it's basically like whatever he wants to do, but he he's in that season of his life. Yes, that's great. Now, how can our patient base, uh, our patient base, <laughs> you know, pick it. How can our podcast listeners get a hold of you or find out more information about you, where you're located, so on and so forth? Yeah, we're all, you can tell we are both practitioners who are thinking of patients over. <laughs> we refer to people as patients. Yeah, but <laughs> that's no. funny. That works. But yeah, everything's at drwillcole.com. That's D-R-W-I-L-L-C-O-L-E.com. And we have video classes on there. If people want to geek out on some of maybe more advanced things that we talked about today. And there's tons of articles I write every week. I'm writing something. Um, and yeah, we offer for a free health evaluation for people who want to maybe get a functional medicine perspective on their case. It's all at drwillcole.com. Great. Thank you. Any last words, Doc? No, I'm really thankful for having me on. Uh, I really do appreciate it and allowing me to speak about this stuff. Yeah. Like I said, I, I loved hearing your information. I, I'm looking forward to hearing more and I'm looking forward to your new book for sure. Uh, so thanks again for being on. My name is Dr. Noah DeCoyer, your co-host, and you are listening to the Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. You can sign up for our incredible weekly email at www.beyondyourwildestgenes.com. Thank you. And as my oldest son Hayden says, be awesome and never unawesome. Three, 
four, get my shoes and out the door. Five, I'm alive, six, seven, eight, feeling great.